Republic and dynasties and around wars, but it didn't focus on subjects like social history. You can still find this pattern in school books today. One reason for this may be a pragmatic one. It's easier to write and repeat history as a history of war and domination than all social life because it's easier to find the traces of war and power such as swords and castles than of caring for children day by day or looking for food. The other reason may be a psychological or psychological one. The uncritical internalization of hier hierarchic structures and a remarkable fascination for violence in its many forms, including power, authority, and the rule of law. But by writing history according to empires and war, the assumption that the world is primarily constructed and organized around violence is confirmed and stabilized. War becomes the normality, and from this perspective, peace the exception. Moreover, peace doesn't give the most attention, war does. So we shouldn't be surprised that on the internet or as titles of books and lectures, we find a formulation like war and peace, much more than peace and war. You may think it doesn't matter, but the order of the two realities is critical. If you start a sentence with war, the priority lies with war. If you start it with peace, the priority is with peace. As it is represented here, peace studies usually refers to peace and war, and it perceives history above all as social history. Thank you so much, um, Hannah, for reading this out very well. And now I'm very happy to welcome you all to Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa, where we discuss pertinent issues of peace in Africa and around the world. And today we have the pleasure of having two prominent speakers. We have Antonio Allegretti, who is an anthrop anthropologist at the University of Lancaster in the UK. Of course, I know Antonio so for many years, we used to work together and we still work together. And he's a very hard working man. <laughs> and uh, of course, also uh, Brian Galligan, who is uh, a researcher at the Jesuit Justice and Ecology Network Africa, based uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, also our neighbor here. So it's really a pleasure having both of you. Thank you very much for your time. And they'll be taking us through a very important topic, uh, which is building peace in troubled waters, human rights, fish as food, and the blue economy in the Western Indian Ocean. I would like now to invite you, uh, Antonio, to please uh, share your screen. And um, I will invite also everybody else to please uh, mute uh, their microphones so that we have a, a clearer uh, reception. So thank you very much. And for those who are joining us for the first time today, you are warmly welcome. Thank you very much indeed. And Antonio, the floor is yours. Right, right. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, George, for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk finally after so many months, maybe years of promises on my side. <laughs> uh, so yes, as, uh, as you said, uh, we have worked with George for many years uh, in Tanzania. And right now I'm, uh, I'm a researcher at uh, Lancaster University. I work on uh, governance of fisheries, particularly in uh, East Africa, but also to a lesser extent in West Africa. And uh, the main, I mean, the main uh, the core of my research is around uh, 
making the governance of fisheries a more nutrition sensitive. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, several concepts that are connected to one another with the governance of fisheries as, uh, as the driving uh, concept, let's say. Um, so let me check that everybody can see my, my slides. George. Yes, yes, I can see, I can see your slide. Okay, great, thank you very much. So I will uh, give the first part of this uh, talk and then Brian Galligan uh, will continue with the second part um, of the talk itself. So as I said before, um, I will be talking about several different things uh, like peace, security, food, nutrition and fish. So I will be fleshing out different relationships within between these concepts, which apparently seem disconnected from one another. Uh, but I will hope that over the, the course of this presentation, uh, I will be able to highlight the links that exist between all these different uh, topics and uh, elements, let's say. Uh, so this is, this is the content of the presentation. I will start by giving a little uh, bit of global context on the on food production and distribution uh, at global level. And then I will move on to the to the question of malnutrition and this thing that we call hidden hunger. I will try to flesh out what uh, to the bank what hidden hunger is and uh, how fish plays a role in the context of uh, malnourished communities and malnourished countries. Uh, then I will move on uh, to the uh, geographical context uh, today, which is the Western Indian Ocean, um, so the eastern part of, of Africa. And then finally, I will move on to um, nutrition sensitive governance of fisheries. So how to make the governance of fisheries more nutrition sensitive. And finally, Brian will talk about uh, how human rights uh, play a part in the efforts towards uh, nutrition sensitive governance of fisheries in uh, specifically in the Western Indian Ocean. Right, so we know that food is very important, of course, and we know that uh, inadequate, inadequate uh, quantity and quality of food uh, have very long-standing and uh, negative implications and negative effects on populations. The very direct, uh, more clear uh, effect of inadequate quantity and quality of food is of course disease, uh, impaired physical and mental development, especially for uh, more vulnerable uh, people like uh, pregnant women and uh, children, specifically children who are in the first 1000 years of their lives. So the first two years um, and a few days more. Another thing that is not highlighted uh, very often is that beyond the single individuals, beyond, beyond the nutritional status of single individuals, malnutrition also uh, affects negatively whole countries because it lowers the adult uh, work productivity. And as a consequence, uh, the GDP of countries also is affected. So malnutrition is not only about the health of the single individuals, but it's also about the health, including the economic health, of uh, countries in general. So this is an infographic that I find very interesting, of course. It, it may seem a little uh, complex uh, at first sight, but I will try to break it down slowly so that uh, the information comes across more clearly. Uh, so on top here, you can see now in the, in the top bar, surrounded by the, the, the red uh, rectangle, you can see all food that is produced globally. So you can see uh, in, the in the middle, you can see whole grains, and then on the right, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, and then again on the right, starchy vegetables. And on the left, you can see the food that is more uh, nutritious, uh, like the animal-based products, like red meat, uh, poultry, fish, eggs, milk, dairy, and so on. 
So you can see that at global level, the production of food is already skewed towards uh, the less nutritious food. Still important, of course, whole grains, fruits and vegetables are important, but they are not as nutritious as uh, animal-based products. Of course, here you can make a, a, an argument around the environmental impact of uh, the production of livestock, but here we are talking more about a global level. So we are talking about also poorer regions of the world. So what is interesting in this infographic is that, as you notice here, in the bar at the bottom, the distribution of the food. It's not only about the production of the food, but it's also the distribution of the food. You can see that on the right, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia uh, get most of the food. Uh, I mean, the food they get is mostly the, the, the starchy food, which is the less nutritious food, while regions of the world that are more, uh, that are richer, like uh, Europe, um, uh, North America get uh, most, most of this food supplies in the food sec in the fr from more nutritious food uh, like animal based products, uh, milk, uh, dairy, and so on. So you can see there is a problem in, in the production of the food, but there is also a problem in the distribution of the food. So this uh, situation at global level is, uh, is connected to this. Uh, these maps show some of the prevalence, uh, the prevalence of some of the uh, forms of malnutrition, some of the most widespread forms of malnutrition at global level. So what I said before, when I said that uh, poorer regions of the world like Africa and South Asia get, uh, don't get enough uh, nutritious food, but they get most of their food, yeah. uh, most of their food is the, the starchy food. Not working. Please go ahead, Antonio. And South Asia. Can you see the, the arrow here? Yes, I'm, I can see yeah, it. I'm pointing at, uh, for instance, this is uh, a map of uh, prevalence of anemia. So you can see Africa and South Asia are the most affected, as well as zinc deficiencies. Um, calcium deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies. You see that Africa and South Asia are the most affected in all these forms, uh, by all these forms of malnutrition, because partly of what I said before about the distribution of food at global level. So this is where uh, fish comes in. Uh, fish is uh, such an important uh, source of uh, protein and uh, micronutrients for uh, over 4 billion people in the world uh, who get uh, over 15% of their uh, intake of protein uh, from fish. And uh, the regions of the world that are particularly dependent of fish are those that are in the tropics, which are knowingly some of the poorer parts of the world. Um, however, fish uh, is not uh, counted, is not given the necessary uh, importance at the level of, uh, of policies uh, at global level. So our research at Lancaster is partly about uh, lobbying and advo advocating for more importance of fish in uh, nutritional strategies uh, at country level, at, at global level as well. So this was a little bit of uh, general context when it comes to food production, distribution, nutrition, uh, at global level. Uh, now I want to move on and see how this situation play out in, uh, in a specific geographical context uh, that we are discussing today, which is the Western Indian uh, Ocean region. So the Western Indian Ocean region, as you see in the map, is the part of East Africa, the East African part, uh, going from Somalia all the way down to South Africa. So it includes mainland African countries such as Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and South Africa, but also smaller island states uh, such as Comoros, the Mauritius, and the Seychelles. This is a region with the very high 
uh, population. And uh, most of these countries that are part of the Western Indian Oceans are in the lower and middle income uh, range. When it comes to the ocean and uh, the resources that are uh, the ocean-based resources, uh, the Western Indian Ocean is such an important uh, region of the world, and it's estimated that uh, the region as a whole has a gross marine product of over 20 billion and an overall ocean asset base of over $300 billion. This includes everything that is related to the ocean, so not only the fish that is in the water, but also uh, industrial development that is connected to, to the ocean, like extraction of oil, extraction of other uh, raw material, uh, but also includes uh, other ocean-based assets like the natural landscape, which leads to tourism, for instance. So when it comes to the gross marine product that I was talking before about, um, this includes everything that is related to the ocean. So you can see the figures indicate that uh, the Western Indian Ocean is such an important uh, region and uh, such an important region when it comes to ocean-based uh, assets. Now within the region, almost half of the people are uh, highly dependent on uh, fisheries and uh, other uh, coastal resources because of course the geography of the region is a coastal region. So naturally, so many people in this uh, in the in the, in the region are dependent on coastal uh, assets and resources. At the same time, while there is this uh, very strong dependency on the natural resources, on the coastal resources, um, the population in this region is always is also having, having to face uh, global challenges like uh, climate change, the progressing uh, warming of temperatures which lead of course to uh, negative consequences for the environment as a whole. Like for instance, it's very famous the, the fact that coral reefs are becoming more and more uh, affected by climate change. And coral reefs are such an important uh, ecosystem niche uh, in the region, but also at global level, because they also allow the reproduction of fish and the reproduction of the overall uh, marine ecosystem. And these uh, environmental uh, challenges also affect the food-related uh, situation uh, because they affect um, the availability of fish, the availability of, uh, of seafood in general, which uh, people are so much dependent on. Now, this is a graph uh, for, from one of the main countries in the Western Indian Ocean, which is uh, Kenya. And, uh, and the focus country of, uh, of my project here in Lancaster. Uh, so you can see in this graph, uh, the food related situation in Kenya. Here you can see that uh, the situation is steadily and slowly, not so slowly actually, quite rapidly, uh, worsening from the point of view of, uh, of food security and nutrition security. So for instance, between 2016 and 2021, there is already a visible uh, worsening of the food security situation in, uh, in the country. And this is even more um, worrying uh, on the coast. Uh, so the coast compared to the average of the country is even more negatively affected by nutrition related, so by forms of malnutrition. And the coast of Kenya is one of the poorest actually regions of, uh, of the country. You can see here, for instance, compared to the average of Africa, if you take Kenya in 2021, you can see that Kenya is actually doing worse uh, compared to the average of Africa when it comes to food and nutrition related situation. And overall, both Kenya and all of Africa are doing worse uh, compared to the, the global situation. Now, I want to move on to the question of uh, governance. 
because as you understand efforts and actions when it comes to the management of natural resources uh, are about the overall governance of uh, of the region uh, not only when it comes to fisheries but also when it comes to overall governance of coastal resources so the ocean of ocean governance in the western indian ocean has been taking very clear direction uh, in the last few decades maybe in the last couple of decades um, and this direction is uh, mainly i can yeah sorry uh, the direction that the governance of oceans is taking is towards increasing uh, maritime security rather than more attention to the needs of the local population of course the efforts towards maritime security are very important and are very meaningful considering the situation uh, of uh, the western indian ocean because the western indian ocean in the last couple of decades has been actually uh, negatively affected by uh, very important management and sustainability challenges like for instance piracy which we know very well especially in the in the northern part of the region uh, iuu fishing iuu stands for uh, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing as well as wars and uh, migration flows so the focus of ocean governance on maritime security is uh, justified by these uh, real challenges that re really exist in the region. So these efforts in uh, maritime security uh, have led to a web of physical activities, like for instance, uh, patrolling, but also uh, images and uh, ideas connected to a secure ocean or secure oceans. So we have both the activities and the implementation of activities in maritime security, but also the narratives and the ideas and images around achieving secure oceans. So we could say there's been, there is an ongoing effort towards uh, achieving this new order at sea, uh, which would replace the assumed disorder that uh, these management challenges have uh, created in the last couple of decades, piracy, IEU fishing wars and migration. The second piece of the puzzle when it comes to ocean governance is the, the focus on economic development. So the ocean as a gateway to development. Um, there is this new concept that has been, uh, that has become so dominant in the narratives and also in the um, activities and uh, projects funding as well uh, around coastal development in the Western Indian Ocean, which is the so-called blue economy. It's a overall concept that um, wants to promote and advocate for an overall sustainable development of uh, coastal resources, which is uh, beneficial for economic development, but also for human development, but it doesn't always work like that, unfortunately. Maritime security, which I discussed before, becomes an enabler of the blue economy. So through maritime security, according to new strategies and new funding in the blue economy in the Western Indian Ocean and globally, through maritime security, uh, policymakers and uh, international actors, international agencies are trying to achieve uh, the sort of economic development that is based on uh, the exploitation of uh, coastal resources. So in the last few years, there has been a pouring in of international funding from uh, international donors like the European Union, uh, World Bank, and all this sort of multilateral uh, and global organizations, like for instance, the Go Blue program in Kenya and other similar program in uh, Tanzania, the Blue Economy Program for Climate Change Adaptation and uh, financing mechanisms for sustainable blue economy development in Mozambique. So these programs uh, have 
uh, maritime security as one of the most important pillars uh, and enabler of uh, economic uh, development. So the blue economy, as well as maritime security, in a way turn the ocean from an empty space uh, and they, look, they consider the ocean as the new frontier of capital accumulation, as if oceans are uh, placeless places with no people and with no uh, other interests, no other stakes uh, by other people other than uh, these organizations themselves. So together, maritime security and uh, the blue economy are uh, contributing to the shrinking of space for small scale actors uh, who have a stake in ocean governance. And this leads to marginalization, vulnerabilities, and invisibilities of these uh, small scale actors who often don't get uh, a share of the stake or don't get the possibility to have their voices heard in, the, in these new uh, programs and uh, efforts for economic development. So these are actors that are small scale, they are highly dependent on uh, fish-based economies. They mostly work in the post-harvesting sector, like for instance, traders, processors, uh, women, uh, youth. Um, and these uh, specific actors do not get or are not getting enough uh, space within this uh, new uh, program in blue economy and uh, coastal development in the Western Indian Ocean, but also global level uh, in many other regions in the global south. So this is where our efforts in uh, nutrition sensitive governance are coming in. So for instance, uh, here in Lancaster, we have tried to uh, come up with a sort of framework to explain uh, how governance of oceans Need to, uh, need to change in order to account for the voices of these uh, small scale actors. And uh, we have come up with a sort of framework uh, around uh, um, governance of fisheries, governance uh, of oceans, uh, a framework to analyze uh, research findings and to create a strategic, uh, to have a strategy behind uh, our research and our um, outreach activities. So this framework is made of uh, three main pillars uh, and based on review of literature. Uh, the three pillars are extending the boundaries of fisheries governance, integrating multiple forms of knowledge and uh, prioritizing domestic and local needs. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'm just going, uh, I will just go through each single pillar and then leave this, uh, the floor to, to Brian to finish the, the presentation. Uh, somebody is speaking. Um, please go ahead and I think he will uh, mute his microphone. Okay. Uh, so this uh, framework for nutrition sensitive governance is made of uh, three pillars. The first pillar is about extending the boundaries of fisheries governance. What, what, what does it mean, extending the boundaries of fisheries governance? It means that in history, the governance of the oceans have been uh, grounded into the, um, the realm of, uh, of fishing rights. So who has the right? to fish and who doesn't have that right to fish. So all the actors that are um, outside of uh, the realm of fishing have been excluded from the discussion, from the debate around uh, governance of oceans. Um, and these actors are the actors that I was uh, referring to before. Those, uh, the, the whole host of people working in the post-harvesting uh, phase of fisheries like those who process the fish, uh, those who market the fish. And these are the actors that are usually the smaller scale ones, uh, including women, uh, poor women, and, uh, and youth as well, who are usually the most 
vulnerable uh, actors in the fisheries value chains. The second pillar of uh, the nutrition sensitive governance of fisheries is uh, grounded in the consideration that we need to rethink what oceans are and what they should do. So up to now, oceans have been uh, considered like the frontier for economic development. Uh, so the main concerns around, nutri uh, around uh, the governance of oceans were about uh, conserving the environment while at the same time continuing to exploit uh, the natural resources. So there was not much room there about considering fish um, as a source of nutrients, as a source of food, especially for the most uh, vulnerable people in, uh, globally. And finally, we have the, the third pillar, which in a way connects uh, this uh, first part of the presentation to the next one on, uh, human, um, on human rights. Uh, the third pillar of nutrition sensitive governance is around um, human-centered images of fisheries. So there has been in the last a uh, few years, this uh, new debate around how do we give the ocean a more human face? How do we consider the ocean um, a source not only of economic benefits, but also a source of well being for the people who depend on them? So, within this pillar, we also consider the question of uh, human rights, which has become a very important debate in. Um, the field of uh, fisheries and uh, ocean governance, human rights. So how to shift from a paradigm that is based only on uh, fishing rights, so who has the right to go into the water and fish, to a paradigm that is actually uh, based on a much more holistic and broad um, set of uh, rights, which have to do with the fundamental uh, rights of human beings. Uh, like the right to food, the right to have a happy life, the right to, have, to live in a clean environment, and so on. So these are the sort of debates and uh, ideas that now I invite uh, Brian to flesh out in more uh, details. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very um, much indeed, Antonio. Yes, please go ahead, uh, Brian. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just by, so thank you, first of all, Antonio, and it's great to be here, George. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and I will, I will pick up really right where Antonio just left off with that question of anchoring nutrition-sensitive governance within a human rights framework, um, especially within the context of the developments that we're seeing in ocean governance in the Western Indian Ocean and elsewhere. Um, particularly in the global south where um, current developments are, are very technocratic, they're very top down and they're very centered on securitization um, rather than on providing for the people already occupying ocean spaces. Um, and to do that, what we're, one of the things that Antonio and I have looked at and discussed is how do we operationalize norms so introduce ethical norms into these conversations into these governance frameworks but in a way that is specifically operational and effective um, and uh, i think human rights are are one very important way to do that they're not the most uh, progressive ethical framework available to us um, and for that reason they sometimes get kind of a bad uh, rap i think in in more progressive communities but there are real advantages to using uh, this particular framework, which I hope will become clear. Um, I also hope, I'm realizing now that my uh, PowerPoint is on a timer, so that's problematic, but it's okay. Um, we'll, we'll work with that. So the, um, the, okay, there we go. So I hope this question is not too pedantic, but I think it's important to just define our terms. And I know that we have people coming from lots of different backgrounds here. Um, and I think we often have conceptions of what human rights are, but um, may not have a, a definition. And sometimes it can be hard to pinpoint a stable definition. So for us, we're using, uh, we're borrowing this definition from David Shu 
which is simply that a human right is the rational basis to make a justified moral demand. So it's anything that I, and we can talk about communal rights too, I or my community um, demand of my community of justice, whether that's my country or the world, um, or uh, more realistically often a, a smaller unit than that. Um, and to really be clear that they're based on human dignity, they kind of hang off of this underlying concept that we as humans have inherent dignity simply because we exist, simply because we are humans. And that is what gives us the basis to make specific rights claims. Um, and really we'll see kind of how human dignity is the only stable part of a human rights framework. There are particular things that we all need to live a dignified human life and we call those rights, um, but we always have to justify them some way. And that's also how we can justify the development of these frameworks, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then of course, when we talk about human rights, we know they're universal, indivisible, and interdependent. Um, that's just language straight out of um, pretty traditional uh, legal interpretations of, of human rights frameworks. Um, and the reason that we're talking about them is because they're also legal responsibilities of the state. Well, there are other norms that we might want to assert. We can get pretty far with human rights. And because many or most, well, all states in some way have taken on um, responsibilities for assuring human rights for their own citizens, um, that can get us pretty far in terms of operationalizing them in a governance setting. Um, I want to just briefly address this question of are human rights actually universal? Um, Antonio and I are both, you know, we're working within this context of the Western Indian Ocean. Um, Antonio was was based in Africa for many years and I am currently based in Africa. And, and this is a big question coming from the global South. Um, there is no denying the fact that human dignity itself is a Western philosophical concept. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is really explicitly based on a particular understanding of enlightenment philosophy, which can get traced back to um, philosophical and theological natural law frameworks. Um, and, and that is what we get in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there, there's a case that people make. Um, and of course, we can also look at the way that power and politics functioned in the post-World War II era when we were defining human rights um, that, uh, to make the case that um, especially the global South is left out of this, uh, this framework. However, um, we, it is, I think the best framework we have on the global level. It's also really important to note that human rights were not originally a product of the West. The biggest champions of human rights between nineteen African states, the first regional human rights charter um, is the African Charter of Human Rights. Um, and uh, there's also lots of, lots of consistency between the concept of human dignity and non-Western philosophical tradition. So it's there's, I think it's important to note that it's a product of, of a Western dominated negotiation process, especially if we're talking about um, the rights frameworks that have come out of the intergovernmental space, which is what we'll kind of focus on, um, but that it doesn't have to be limited to that. We don't have to let ourselves be kind of imprisoned by that idea. I want to just briefly highlight, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I want to briefly highlight these are not all of, far, they're far from all of the global human rights instruments, but these are most of the big ones. Um, and I wanna highlight a really important distinction for our purposes when we're talking about operationalizing human rights is the difference between um, legally binding and non-legally binding declarations. We have the non-legally binding declarations in red and then the conventions or covenants which are legally binding in green and really important to name the fact that uh, the non-binding resolutions are always much more progressive um, and promise uh, much more than anything that is legally binding. And when it comes down to um, negotiating things that are in fact legally binding, we get much smaller promises. And even in uh, those 1966 documents, the international uh, the two the two covenants, what are sometimes called the International Bill of Human Rights, um, but the one on civil and political rights, and there's a separate convention for economic, social, and cultural rights that 
they do have an ambitious list of human rights, um, but what they ask countries to do is very minimal. Um, so these intergovernmental or international documents are important for lots of reasons. They can inform law and judicial opinions. Um, and some of them are in fact legally binding, um, but the requirements are quite small um, or they're quite lax. So the real way that this gets into governance is often through national constitutions um, or through other means. So I want to talk about, uh, particularly for nutrition sensitive governance, uh, kind of new human rights that have uh, really emerged in the last 20 years or so. And they're not really new. So as I mentioned, all human rights hang on this concept of human dignity. So they're really just new articulations of this old concept that to live a basically dignified human life, which is something that what all I humans need. deserve, we need what certain need. things. So. Um, sounds like somebody is, okay. Um, so the first one and the most important one for our purpose, since we're talking about centering food and, and ocean governance is the right to food. Um, in a way, this is the least new of the so-called new human rights. It goes back, so in the Universal Declaration, um, subsist, there's a right to subsistence. Um, in the um, 1966, um, Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, there is a reference to the freedom or that all human, all human beings have the right to freedom from hunger. Um, but we get the it ex explicitly articulated as a right to food beginning in the 90s with the FAO and then actually legally through the UN, um, although FAO is part of the UN system, but through the human rights mechanisms of the United Nations um, in 1999 with this, uh, this is general comment 12, which is the authoritative legal definition um, from the United Nations on what the right to food is. And then that gets affirmed by the, by the General Assembly in I think 2001. Um, and the really significant thing here is that the right to food gets articulated not just as a new right, um, but as something, an obligation that states have already taken on through the existing, the 1966 covenants. So it, it's more of a, it's a re-articulation and the legal opinion from um, from the UN human rights mechanisms is that uh, it's an existing obligation, not a new one. Um, and that's really important, I think, for operationalizing a nutrition sense of approach to governance. We can also um, talk about additional new human rights. And these are particularly important now in the context of an expanding blue economy, expanding securitization, where the next two I'll mention, starting with this one, the right to tenure, really support the right to food. They're kind of um, for our purposes, like two pillars that hold up the right to food in the context of ocean governance and small scale actors. Um, so beginning with this right to tenure, um, which is uh, probably controversial to say that this is a human right. Um, however, it is often protected under the right to property, which is a human right um, within the UN system and within most kind of elaborations of what human rights are. Um, and basically what this says is that if you own property, it cannot be taken from you, right, without due process or compensation or something like that. And particularly when we talk about small scale actors and small scale fisheries having access to their own fishery resources, the resources they've accessed in many cases for uh, very long periods of time, having a right to tenure, having uh, your right to access be protected, um, not just through legislation, but through a constitutional right or through human right, I think is really important and can be effective. And then the second one here is really recent. And this, well, okay, in a way uh, it's less recent because it's been talked about for a long time and it's been incorporated into national frameworks for uh, many years, but it is very recent at the UN level, which is the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So we get this general assembly resolution, which is just uh, not even a year old proclaiming that there is a human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And similarly to the right to food, this is interpreted in terms of existing uh, human rights obligations. So if you want to eat, um, if you uh, want many things, many human rights, a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a crucial part of that picture. You can't have um, 
and especially in the context of oceans, you can't have food, you can't have good fish if you do not have a sustainable environment. Um, Antonio was talking about the uh, connection between climate change and nutrition sensitive governance. And this is one way to, to make that connection more explicit. Um, and just to, as long as we're talking about climate change, just mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. mention, mm -hmm. we, um, we did get um, this human rights explicitly referenced in the most recent uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP27 cover decision in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, in December of last year specifically reference this human right. So it is not only in the UN system, but it's kind of making the rounds and I think more quick to be operationalized than, than some others have in the past. So we have this trio of really important kind of norms uh, that we need to introduce into ocean governance in a, in a stronger way than, um, than we currently have or than they currently are. And one way to do that um, is by incorporating them directly into policy documents. So an example of that would be, this is a document from the FAO, the Voluntary Guidelines for Small-Scale Fisheries. Um, but a second is through uh, legal action. So once we have uh, bad actors in any context, especially if they're governments, using these rights to hold them accountable. And um, there's one kind of notable case where that was done in terms of uh, access rights, access to fisheries in South Africa in a 2007 judgment. But much more recently, we have a 2018 judgment from Kenya. Um, so this is a picture, this is in Lamu, Kenya on the North Coast, close to the border with Somalia. Um, and this is a picture of this mega port under construction. And this is a couple of years old. The first three berths of the port are now operational. Um, and there are uh, many more planned uh, to, to be constructed. So this is just those first three berths under construction. Um, but of course this is done uh, with no consultation of the local community. So the community found out about this project on the news um, and it destroyed uh, the coral. These are coral reef fisheries that these communities rely on. It destroyed the coral in this bay um, and physically displaced fishers from uh, their fishing grounds in the area where the port was constructed and then destroyed their fishing grounds in the rest of this bay. Um, and this is a, you know, a government sponsored project. So the community got together and they're, you know, they're very reliant on these spaces for fisheries and for trade. And so they got together and they kind of put together a consortium of uh, civil society organizations that, that took this project to court. And their asks were actually very minimal. They didn't want the project stopped. They didn't want, um, yeah, I mean, they didn't want the project stopped. They wanted some compensation for what they had what had been taken from them from their from their lost fisheries. Um, but they also just, they wanted the project to follow existing Kenyan environmental law. So, that, so they're very small asks and it was an opportunity for the courts to, to be very conservative. They could have come back with a judgment in favor of the community saying, yes, okay, we have laws, they were broken, please follow the laws, go do your social and environmental impact assessment and then continue construction. But that is not what the court decided, they're really, impressive thing or notable thing is that the court made its decision and yes, decided in the community's favor and gave them what they asked for, but it made its decision based on human rights to life, to property, to culture as protected under the Kenyan constitution um, and ruling against virtually every government agency in favor of this, this small community based on these human rights. So this provides really one example of a way that we can operationalize kind of a more norms-based or ethical, ethically oriented uh, mode of ocean governance for the benefit of, of communities um, who, really, who really rely on these spaces, who already occupy them, who are being pushed out by securitization and by, by these technocratic uh, capital heavy um, governance trends. So I want to, I want to lift this up as, as an example for us to kind of one way to think about connecting these dots. Um, and I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Brian and Antonio. This was really a fantastic presentation. And uh, now um, I'm going to ask for questions and comments from the participants. And I can see some in, in chat. So please, um, Feel free to ask a question or make a comment. 
and this is a global peace studies for sustainable development in Africa. Uh, ben, you want, yeah, Les, please, uh, could you start? Thank you. Okay. Uh, in, and as George said, yes, I'd like to second that. This, this is a really remarkable presentation and such a central issue that's that's so often uh, so often forgotten. I, I was at a UN meeting on um, happiness and well-being uh, about a decade ago, and a, about two-thirds of the way through the day, um, uh, some someone got up and said, I've heard all these wonderful speeches, but nobody's talking about food. It's so basic for happiness and well-being, right? And the other thing that I uh, I often I often um, cite the issue of nutrition and malnutrition uh, when talking about uh, structural violence or systemic violence, um, because this this is malnutrition is really uh, I think the best example of of systemic violence or, or structural violence as as Johann Galton called it. Um, be because it, it kills and harms people just as much as guns, you know, and bombs. Uh, but it's the, who, who is it saying? It's the, the hidden, hidden, hidden hunger, the, the, the issue of hidden hunger. Um, so I, I really uh, appreciate this. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you, if you can say a bit more, both Antonio and Brian, a bit more about, about the solutions. And I, I like the idea of, of um, you know this example of what happened in Kenya, but um, you know what what can we do about it? We tend to to focus a lot on on the problem, and you've done that extremely well. But I imagine that you you both have more ideas about what we can do. Thanks. Thank um, you very much. Actually, you could respond, um, Antonio or Brian. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could both say a couple of words about this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lester. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you liked the presentation and uh, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, yes, uh, nutrition is, uh, it, I think it's very important to have a nutrition approach uh, to these sort of issues because as long as the nutrition approach is a little bit less orthodox than uh, it's been in the last, uh, I mean, in history, I would say, uh, I mean, for much of the 20th uh, century, all the food related questions were approached with a very technical uh, approach saying uh, we were not, I mean, the debate was not about, around nutrition, it was around food security. So the point was, how do we make more food for everybody uh, not to starve? So that was a very technical approach. It focused on technology, it focused on uh, quantity. And in a way, for so many decades uh, in, the, in the former uh, century, uh, nobody really talked about the question of access, which is actually the key question when it comes to food. Uh, so as I said, for instance, in the second slides of mine, um, it's not a problem of quantity, it's not a problem of production, although it is partly about production, but it's also, it's more importantly, most importantly, the problem of access and distribution. So uh, as you understand, focusing on access and distribution brings out uh, the massive inequalities, the massive inequalities that exist uh, at global level, at national level, down to the individual families. Uh, so focusing on nutrition, if we do it in a non-technocratic way, non-technological way, uh, really helps in addressing the sort of, uh, some of the most pressing and important global issues that are apparently not even associated to food, but in, in, in actuality they are, because food you know, is one of the drivers of global development. Food is what uh, uh, takes uh, the resources out of our planet, you know, uh, without, uh, so it's one of the most important things that we do as human beings, the production and consumption of food, uh, together with production of energy and other sectors. 
When it comes to solutions, I think the problem here can be the starting point for the solution. I mean, the problem uh, of what I just said, you know, making sure that we focus less on the technological aspects around food, but we focus more on the system thinking uh, when it comes to uh, food. So there is a lot of debate these days around food systems. Uh, so the system thinking is very important because um, it includes, I mean, it's an all encompassing concept which includes uh, both agencies, process, uh, different actors in the, in the realm of food. Um, so I guess the solution is about making sure that there are the spaces uh, for discussion and for discussing food from this different perspective, from the perspective of agency, from the perspective of access, uh, rather than focusing just on improving technology, uh, focusing on producing more food. So it's about opening up the spaces and making the spaces that already exist uh, more sensitive to the question of food and to, uh, to the question of food from the perception of, from the perspective of uh, agency and access. Just to, and just to build on, on that a bit, especially the piece about agency, um, I think that one of the key lessons from the case in Mamu is and also the, this notable South African case I kind of paid lip service to is the role of um, kind of solidarity movements and local communities in really knowing and asserting their own rights in a way that is not just um, like a coherent argument, but also has, allows them to, to press specific policy levers to get the outcomes they need. I'm, I don't wanna to be too optimistic about existing policy levers to make progress on, on things like this, um, but there are some. And I think it's important to make that connection between local and then kind of the savvy technocratic, not that local is not savvy, but in the kind of technocratic world. Um, and, a, and I mean, the, the way to do that is, is, is just democracy. So we talked about kind of these judicial cases and that's like worst, worst case scenario, right? Something bad has happened, so now we try to fix it. A slightly better case scenario is we, um, when we design new laws and policies, we do so ethically rather than economically. Primarily, right, ocean governance is driven by macroeconomic objectives. So we need to replace those with social ethical objectives in a way that, you know, so our binding enforceable provisions um, are, are actually responding to the needs of communities rather than the needs of political and economic elites. But of course, that won't happen until we shift the power balance. And I think that's where real, real democracy comes in. Um, and there's been, I think one promising development in ocean governance has been, especially over the last 20 years or so, has been the growth of co-management approaches, locally led approaches, um, which has kind of been like developing alongside this other kind of securitization um, trend, blue economy trend that Antonio was talking about. Um, and they're often compete, they're often in the same spaces and the same governments. Um, so there is kind of, some momentum that we can we can build on there, but I don't I don't really know how to actually fix the problem. I think that's a really big project. But oh, both of your comments really help. Thank you. I understand that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if I may ask um, Edmond, and please before you ask a question or make a comment, please just introduce yourself briefly so that we know who you are and where you are speaking from. That would be nice. Edmond, please. Edmund Oma. Thank you, George. Yes, thank you, George. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Edmund Oma. Um, uh, listening from uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, we can, can hear you. you Yes, I'm listening from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, this is a very interesting and commendable job done by the two presenters. Really, it's wonderful. And I, I, after listening to them, I've thought of so many other things that really could be looked into in 
in regards to these uh, food security and ecology and the blue economy. I, I was interested in knowing something about the, the, the access, production and access. For example, the, the, the speakers brought it clearly how the nutritive food is not uh, reachable to many people do not have access to it. But I was wondering about if they looked at uh, the issue of dumping and wastage, because some of the food also, a lot of it is produced in many countries, but it's just wasted and dumped, I mean thrown, the dumping and wastage of food. And also, I was also interested in the other aspect of, uh, of access in terms of pricing, although it's not within the scope, but I think also the pricing of food, for example, the uh, seafood. I mean, there is a lamb, but the seafood could be more expensive than even you, you could believe, although I'm just next to the ocean. But lastly, I wanted them also to look at the, the issue of ownership. For example, in some countries, the high seas and the seas and the lakes are owned by, the ownership is different. You cannot just go there and start getting the, the, the fish or something of the sort. There are ownership problems which bring chaos in, the, in, the, in, 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 in access. Uh, I'm sorry that I've raised things which are a little bit scattered, but I feel they could be good issues to deal with especially when you are talking about this important gold. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we go to Afiz and then Dona? Afiz, please. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate uh, the presentation concerning the fish rights because Talking about the fish rights, it boils down to human rights. And I think the two surfaces of the discussion that we had from Antonio and Bria is very, very fantastic. But my question is that the fish rights, is it limited to West Indies Ocean alone, or it covers the other seven oceans? So that's number one question. And number two, Talking about the clean environment and sustainable environment for all assembly, how are you mapping out to cover or to boil down to the lemma in the script? So the first question is that, is the fish right extended to all parts of the ocean? Then, more so, we didn't have the full coverage of the fish rights that we discussed. You only said that the fish rights talk about who and who to fetch in the ocean, but it did not actually elaborate the content of the fish rights. So, I would like if you can spread more light on that fish right, or possibly if you can send the complete right of the fish right, maybe perhaps PDF or any other form. Thank you. Is my question taken? Would you like to respond, uh, Brian or Antonio? I'm happy to respond. Uh, could we, I'm wondering, could we take Donna's question as well before we come back? All right. Uh, Donna, please. Now, I need to know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. It's amazing. Okay, <laughs> I have, <laughs> now, since January, we just got it fixed today. Um, I have a, a, a question and a, a rather complex comment to make. My, my question is small. The shot of the first three bur births in the port of Lamu, was that shot from the Pate side or the Manda side? of the bay between those two islands and the mainland, because the original plan was to put that port 
on an estuary on the mainland, just just above, I, kind of, I want to say north, but it's really east of the Makanda. Or was this shot from the Makanda itself? Or where, where was that shot taken from? And so should I go on yeah. and, and raise I can, uh, I'll just answer that quickly. It's an, it's an aerial photo. It is in the original place. It was planned to be sited. So it's like an aerial okay. photo and the plane is over Pate. It's over Pate. Okay. So the port is going to be on Pate or on the mainland? No, it's it's on the mainland. So like if the plane is so over Pate, then Pate, you're kind of looking across okay. Amanda Bay. Yeah. Uh, my comment then is about food and food supplies and technologies uh, and the issue of acceptance. Um, as you live in East Africa, you know that people from the lake don't want to eat sea fish. And people from the sea don't even know that there's a lake out there. Uh, you know that the, the interior communities between the coast and Lake Victoria um, linguistically define fish as snakes, so they don't eat fish, although that's changing a little bit, but not enough. And I, do, I don't think there's anybody here who was alive in 65 when, it, when there was a famine in Kenya. And the Turkana people near um, Lake Turkana uh, were, were moved into famine relief camps and the United Nations tried to get them to eat fish, which is just unbelievably disgusting and stupid. Um, they now eat fish, but not if they can avoid it. So what I, and you won't remember also, the, the famine in the late 60s, actually it was the famine of 65, when uh, when people were offered famine relief from, from America in the form of yellow maize, which is an abomination in this part of the world. So while we're considering the technology and prospects for increasing food production, is anybody working on food acceptability? Yes, we have a human right and what, but and, okay, I'm gonna go back to 2005, and uh, I think it's 2005, but the Convention on the Rights of the Child, when UNICEF decided to change the approach to a rights-based approach for children's rights, that a child has a right to a school. But if the government can't build a school, where are they going to put the child? Do, do, so rights-based approaches and the right to food is one that kind of concerns me. How, how implementable or enforceable is any rights-based approach. Okay, is, is that enough? <laughs> I'll keep quiet now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there a response to that or comment? Um, maybe Brian, you want to go first? Sure. I'll. I'm happy to go first and I'll start with Donna's last question and then talk about the other things that I think apply more to my part and then you can talk and hopefully between the two of us, we cover everything in some way. Um, yeah, I mean, so first of all, the only thing I would say to your comment about uh, cultural preferences is, is to agree with you um, that that's important. Um, and it's context specific. So we're kind of having this more broad general conversation. And I think once you get down to the, the you know, level of an individual case or an individual community, that the language has to change and, and the way you're thinking through the problems has to, if not like be totally turned around, certainly become uh, much more specific to um, what people are willing to eat. And, and that's that has made its way into the right to food that it should be culturally appropriate and acceptable to people. Um, we're not just like the right to food is not dumping, you know, livestock grade maize in communities that need food. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, how implementable or enforceable is a rights-based approach? Um, I think, uh, it depends uh, what the angle is. If the angle is to just limit it to a judicial approach where you hold, so yes, national national countries on the, national country, national governments on the whole are legally responsible for providing for human rights. So, and, and if you 
you know, use legal legal techniques like this, these class action lawsuits, that is one way to make progress, especially to stop a harm, because we know we can always get somebody to stop doing something. But but you're absolutely right to highlight that, okay, a lot of rights cost money and take capacity and um, a lot of political will. Um, and certainly food would be a really good example of that. So um, I don't think it's super effective to sue a government um, to for you know a positive right um, like that. However, it has happened, right? So one example would be a treatment action campaign uh, in South Africa, getting antiretrovirals um, and getting the government to provide that. Um, or, uh, and there have been similar law lawsuits specifically in South Africa um, in that vein. I think the more important thing is if you're looking to, to kind of uh, accomplish something that would cost a lot of money and take a lot of effort is to say, okay, this is a human right. Um, and to just be very clear about, about that you know, as a way to raise the ethical stakes of the discussion. Um, and then I would say you engage with the policy process in a way that is a little bit more savvy or strategic. Um, so it's not always gonna be, yes, we're gonna hold the state party accountable. Um, and yeah, no, it's not a perfect approach, It's but it's something. And, and I think if we introduce it into this particular ocean governance context, it can help us make progress. I also, I want to speak to, to Peter's comment about property rights um, that uh, they're like very conventional and like very much protect uh, capitalism and the accumulation of capital. Um, and this is another, you know, the first comment I made when I started my presentation, I will stand by is like this, human rights is, is not really the best ethical framework. <laughs> it's not the most progressive thing we could use. Um, the reason that I, and I think Antonia, I hope I'm not speaking for you, have brought it into this context and are pushing it is, is really because um, there are specific legal obligations and there are ways to, they give us access to particular policy, policy levers. Um, but uh, that's it. I think it again comes down to engaging with policy processes in a savvy or strategic way. So I'll be all about the right to property if it's about a, a, you know small scale fishers and their and their tenure rights. Um, and I will I will not be all about it if it's if it's not about that. <laughs> um, so not perfect. Not even always totally coherent. Um, but hopefully strategic from a policy progress point of view. Antonio, I'll let you speak about the other questions. Right, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, there is so much meat on fire, right? Uh, I think maybe I can start with uh, Donna's uh, comment or question around the accessibility of food. Um, maybe, I mean, I, I could just say my own opinion about it. Um, I think, yes, it's important that we consider, of course, you know, the, the cultural diversity uh, of uh, different communities and different countries. Um, but actually, I mean, working towards the direction of uh, pushing for specific foods to be more consumed, even in regions where they are not part of traditional diet, is actually part of many nutrition sensitive strategies uh, including for instance uh, a lot of the work done by the world fish which is the leading uh, research organization in uh, globally so one part of these strategies is around uh, trying to do campaigns and sort of convincing even though it's not a very nice word uh, people to consume specific foods because of the nutritional and also environmental benefits of higher consumption. Uh, so I mean, I guess my own opinion is that as long as that is done uh, tactfully and uh, is not done you know, on a, with that top-down approach, uh, I personally would be in favor of, of, of this sort of campaigns. And even in Kenya, for instance, I remember that there was, I don't remember, I was told uh, a few years ago, there was a more fish, eat more fish campaign or something. Uh, maybe if there are people from Kenya here, they can uh, confirm that. Or uh, I can tell you about that. So there, there was actually already some effort around uh, sort of encouraging people, even in the in the 
in regions where fish is not consumed because there are, there are no waters uh, to consume a little bit more fish because of the nutrition deficiencies that they had. Um, so that's one on, uh, on uh, food acceptability. And uh, I think the first person who asked uh, a question, Edmond, I think, from Dar es Salaam, asked about uh, price, which I found very interesting because, yes, of course, price is one of the um, mechanisms that through which, you know, uh, access is uh, either uh, favored or not. Uh, I mean, of course, seafood is one of the most traded commodities at global level, or food commodities at global level. So while in some cases this leads to conflict, uh, in some cases it leads to conflict with the uh, local consumption, in other cases it, do it doesn't. So for instance, there are different value chains around different uh, seafood products. Uh, so for instance, shrimp uh, or octopus, you know, all these different uh, species. But yes, in some cases, uh, there is conflict between the global markets and the needs for local consumption. And because food is subject to the very harsh, as we know, rule of uh, supply and demand, when the, when the demand globally goes high, uh, the supply, of course, needs to be in line with the demand. And uh, the places where these specific commodities are produced, are fished, normally get uh, the negative consequences and uh, so for instance west africa for instance is a is a very clear example of this where a lot of the fish is fished in uh, on the shores of different countries like ghana senegal uh, ivory coast and uh, a lot of it is processed uh, as uh, fish oil and fish meal and exported outside for uh, and used as feeds for livestock outside of uh, the countries where it is produced. So that definitely leads to conflict between, uh, yeah, human needs, local needs, and, uh, and the global um, demand for food, for, for seafood. And price, of course, is the system through which uh, this uh, lack of access uh, plays out in uh, many places in uh, globally, I would say. So when you go to Dar es Salaam to the market and you can tell the, the fish vendors, please stop selling fish outside, you know, sell it to us because you fished in our waters. So we have the right to eat it. And, uh, and there, is, there are actually debates and efforts in this direction. Like uh, there are efforts towards the direction of food sovereignty, for instance, whereby local people should have decision making over the food that is produced where they live um, so having more decision making uh, uh, more um, voice when it comes to the trade uh, so this was about price and uh, maybe i can see a couple of words on uh, on the fishing rights i think uh, somebody from i don't know from where i can't remember this Afiz, I think, asked the question about, about um, fishing rights. Um, well, what, what I could say is that, and maybe, maybe Brian will, will add something about this. I think he knows a little bit more than me about this. Um, he knows more about rules and laws and frameworks, and, uh, legal rules and so on. Um, oh, there, there is a hierarchy of, uh, there is often a hierarchy of, rules you know you start with the local level and the national level all the way up to international treaties and inter international conventions and so on and uh, one of the, the root of the i mean one of the causes of the um of why fishing rights always often do not favor the small scale actors is that rules on the local level are much harsher as compared to the conventions and the treaties at global level so when you think about you know, the local management of fisheries, uh, the rules are enforced quite well, actually. And because the people who are subject to those rules are the smaller scale uh, actors, of course, they get the negative uh, effect of, of these uh, quite harsh rules around 
who should go in the water and should who shouldn't go into the water. But as you go all the way up to international, I don't know how to call them treaties or conventions, uh, many of them are not binding. And because the large scale actors are normally regulated through those conventions, uh, as a result of that, you know, they usually do what they want. And because they don't fish on shore, but they fish uh, in the deep sea, they they are able to bypass the rules around um, the rights of access to to water and to fishing. I think that was a little bit of uh, thoughts about what people asked and what people said. And maybe if you have anything else to say, Brian. Um, I won't. I won't say a lot. Just to briefly kind of. Uh, when we're talking about uh, tenure as a right or access to fish as a right, um, that's usually territorial and kind of limited to inshore waters, which would be historically fished by, by communities. Um, there are all kinds of, like the, the way jurisdictions overlap um, in, in the oceans gets really complicated. The way rights are allocated is very complicated and changes from country to country. Um, and I, I, I would love to, to talk more about that, but, but specifically the right, like the human right piece often is territorial and inshore. And that, that was the issue really in the South African case um, is that the South African government had done um, what lots of countries do um, and split up rights by species. And so they gave the most valuable species, whether they were important for food security or not to industrial fisheries um, and small scale fishers communities had been actually gotten more poor in the post-apartheid era in part because of that. Um, but that is that is all I will say. Perfect. So far, so good. And I could see also a comment in, in the chat uh, from Howard Richards. And uh, I don't know whether you wanted to say something, uh, Howard. Um, sorry, uh, Howard asked not to speak. Okay. Um, he's, he's recovering uh, from a right. small medical adventure. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Peter, you also had a comment that, uh, of course, Brian touched upon, but uh, maybe you would like to elaborate a bit uh, on that. Oh, well, uh, I, I should... I should stay more silent in these things because I'm much less educated. But having worked directly on deck in the shellfish industry, I'm familiar with this interface between local concerns uh, with people who get their hands wet and uh, regulation. And right now, there is a very big fight going on on both coasts of the United States uh, in which the fishing industry is facing a regulation which will require them to spend more money than they can on improved equipment to protect whales. So the fishing industry is against this, and the government is trying to implement it. At least this government is. The next government, if it's the other party, will probably destroy all that again. And uh, meanwhile, in the public is, is concerned that the fishing industry is against whales. Now, uh, you know, in my case, I worked for the oyster fisheries on the deck of a sailboat in the Chesapeake Bay in the 80s and 90s. And uh, the Chesapeake Bay is an estuary with a very complex uh, ecosystem in which the oysters play a significant role in maintaining the quality of the water and are being buried in silt and radioactive waste. <laughs> and today, the latest issue seems to be PFOA forever chemicals, which are highly carcinogenic and mutagenic. That is, they're hormone disruptors and they don't go away, and they're in every cell of every living body. 
now and deep in the ocean floor. And the chemicals continue to be produced, uh, thousands of new ones every, every day. Uh, last report I read was that the government had tested 52 of them in the space of a year. Uh, so the fish are, are becoming a deadly threat we're talking about nutritional deficiencies. Uh, there are also uh, excesses of these poisons, um, and particularly these affect people who eat more fish. So, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, once in a while for a big treat, I go and have a, a sushi meal. But I'm, now I'm kind of thinking, you know, even at that level, it's probably risky. So it's, uh, on one hand, I appreciate the great courage that it takes to attack these problems specifically, and you've been very specific, even though this is contextual at this level. Uh, even to, uh, to, to enter it at the, mid, uh, the midpoint of this stack of paradigms, if I can say it that way, uh, takes enormous courage. Um, it's not foolish. Um, it is effective to a degree, and uh, you know, I'm I'm talking too much, but I'll say this: since we can manage the world at scale, as evidenced by current malpractice, there's no doubt that we're failing catastrophically. Mismanagement must be seen as criminal, and perpetrators must be prevented from doing further damage. Unfortunately. These same human beings now control the overwhelming proportion of the planet's resources as well as the logistical machinery to accomplish global management. So what I'm saying is, if we can't find a way to that level of paradigm change, uh, the rest of it goes down the tubes. And I am a hopeful person. I think Definitely that the today. things that will mitigate this may be invisible to us, but may save us anyway. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, intervention, uh, Peter. And um, we are actually coming close to the end of our program for today. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your participation and for the presentations. Uh, Antonio and Brian, this has been really wonderful. And uh, Ben has a small announcement to make, and I would like to ask him also to just say it in uh, 30 seconds. And next week, of course, you're going to meet again. I invite you uh, to listen to the presentation by Peter Cousins, also in the UK, uh, talking about the 100 years of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. So we'll be celebrating 100 years with, with Peter and the rest. So please, Ben. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, please, just a quick announcement. Uh, we will be having a conference in Panama on environmental peace building. And this actually um, to help solicit for much more knowledge in the field, skills and everything that anyone can bring on board so we would like to invite everyone who has time. That will be on the 26th of this month through Zoom. So I have attached it, um, the invitation letter to our group and everybody should feel free and read it. And if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And on that note, I would like to wish you a very nice day, nice evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa. Bye bye for now. Thank you very much. How can we start with Ben? Have my email. Ben, how can we okay. Uh, please, I, I attach Thank my email so to the message I sent. So you can. All right. Thank you. Okay.